20 seconds if you just want to power your phones down or, or uh, shut the volume down. Uh, keep the leaf steam to report to an hour. And we'll let you know if there's any breaking news on LRT. Uh, I'll just let the last few people come in and we'll get started in 20 seconds. Plus, everything really good back there? Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jim Poling, Managing Editor of the Hamilton Spectator. I'm very pleased uh, to be in this room, to be welcoming you here uh, with the uh, Hamilton Community Foundation and uh, uh, Dr. Jean Clinton, uh, world renowned uh, speaker and uh, a very, very important topic. Uh, it's a special night. This, uh, we're in the SPEC Auditorium, and uh, this event strengthens our partnership with Hamilton Community Foundation and the work that uh, Kerry Cook and his board and other members, uh, researchers here, have done with uh, with Code Red and, and the spectator. Um, and we started that work, oh, I'd say about seven years ago. Uh, we kept it going, and each year it just seems to get more and more powerful. We have new work coming. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll let Terry expand on, on uh, uh, Dr. Clinton and uh, some of the Code Red work. But just some uh, fundamentals for the night. Uh, Terry promises we'll be out by 9 o'clock tonight. Um, there are bathrooms through this door and to the right. Uh, there's the ladies on, on the left and men on the right. Um, we'll try and keep the doors open so the, the airflow uh, keeps it cool. And, uh, that's it. So I'll turn it over to Harry. Thank you again, and welcome to the Hamilton Spectator. We're we good to go. Can you hear me? Yes. Let me start by welcoming everybody here and uh, expressing my enthusiasm for a community that is so engaged in this issue the issue of how we make sure that all of our kids have the opportunities that many of us have been afforded and often taken for granted. Uh, what is the difference we can all make, and how do we understand the dynamics of helping to chart a path for young people to success? Uh, I'm Terry Cook. I'm the CEO of the Hamilton Community Foundation, and it's my honor to uh, to be a spectator. And, and uh, I should say, as a newspaper junkie who used to, on Sunday mornings, take my paper road money from the spec and go to Hopkins Variety in Westdale to buy the Sunday edition of the New York Times or the Cleveland Nine Dealer or the Chicago Tribune, um, that this is a tough time to be in the newspaper business. And The Spectator has done an extraordinary amount for a daily and a mid-sized market uh, to add value to important conversations. And Jim mentioned the Code Red series, uh, the Vital Science partnership that they have with us, and I can tell you that they punch above their weight relative to any daily newspaper in this country, and they have fundamentally changed the conversation around poverty by postal code mm -hmm. in Hamilton and its disastrous effects on health and educational outcomes. And they've influenced public policy and major institutions in the way in which we come about these things. So why are we here tonight other than to hear a great speaker with deep roots in Hamilton, a cathedral girl who mm -hmm. proudly continues to make a difference in child development both here and around the world. Uh, we're here partially because of a journey that we've been on in the Community Foundation. About a dozen years ago, under the leadership of my predecessor, Carolyn Milne, who was here tonight, uh, and, and Joanne Pryle of the city of Hamilton, uh, we had been the beneficiaries of one of the largest gifts in Canadian history. And our board stepped back and said, you know, this is a rare opportunity as a foundation to think strategically about how we can make a difference. And after a lot of evaluation and critical analysis, we determined that there were many needs in this community, and we had a broad mandate to touch everything from the arts to the environment to education. But ultimately, if we didn't struggle as a community with concentrated poverty and its impact on educational and health outcomes, we as a community couldn't improve our trajectory. We would leave too many behind. That's when we started the neighborhoods work, the community development work, we started the requested neighborhood that built into a robust partnership with the city of Hamilton, and that today I think has been part of the narrative that is changing the way people feel about 
their relationships to Hamilton, about the optimism relative to our future and the transformation of this community. Uh, but ultimately, as we listened to residents who were proud of the difference that we were starting to make in neighborhoods, they said there were two issues that we weren't making progress on. One was the creation of employment opportunities that provided real jobs and living wages in Hamilton. Continues to be a major problem in a Rust Belt community that's lost a whole lot of, of uh, industrial jobs. For a community foundation, that's not a problem that we can answer. It's really the purview of the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Department and private and public sector employments. But the other piece was the number of people we were leaving behind educationally and the dramatic difference. You know, Code Red, I think, solidified for a whole lot of people that there was a 21 year life expectancy difference between affluent and impoverished neighborhoods and that there was an unbelievable gap in educational attainment and post-secondary participation between kids living in low-income neighborhoods and those who grew up as my daughters growing up in Southwest Hamilton attending West High School. Uh, and that was a human tragedy and it was a huge competitive disadvantage to this community. And out of that work, we were lucky enough about two years ago to strike a partnership with Heidi Balsilli and the Fairmount Foundation. Again, somebody with deep roots here and deep commitment to the difference education can make start a journey with the Higher Education Quality Council to look at ways in which community foundation can work to improve educational outcomes for all children in public schools. And it was about a year ago that we had Governor General David Johnson here to launch our 10-year minimum $10 million commitment that we call Advocates. Um, it's been supported by a whole lot of people, some of whom are in this room tonight, um, who have supported our community fund over many years. It's allowed us to have the capacity to tackle tough issues. It involved intensive research, program design, and ultimately we are now into execution. Before we give you the main speaker tonight, I'm going to ask my Vice President of Community Initiatives and Grants, Matt Goodman, uh, to tell you a little bit about Advocates and the work that we're presently executing with some great partnerships with our two local school boards, with our post-secondary education, and with partners like the Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCA, the Industry Education Council, Empowerment Squared, and others that share our deep commitment to improving outcomes for all kids. Because the one thing we know, having looked at the best practices and the most successful interventions in North America, is that with great respect to my board member and the Director of Education, uh, Manny, who's sitting over here, teachers and schools and principals and school boards on their own will not change the trajectory. It takes an entire community committed to making a difference. And that's what we're undertaking. And we think that the, the presentation we hear from Jean, Jean is entirely in that wheelhouse. So let me say that I'm proud of our team, led by Matt Goodman and others. Uh, and I would ask you to uh, welcome Matt to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing with that. And over uh, the past couple years, very proud to work with my team on the development of Abacus. Um, Abacus is part of a 10 year commitment, uh, the goals of which are to improve high school graduation rates and to increase access to post secondary. Um, these are broad, large goals, and as Terry mentioned, these are not goals that we alone, the school board alone, or any one community organization are going to be able to achieve. This is a community effort. Collective impact, if you will, is really what we're striving for. I'm going to talk a little bit about the program um, details and kind of where it came from and how it's evolved and, and where we're at today. Um, as you will have probably inferred, Abacus focuses on the middle school years. Um, and this was quite purposeful and quite uh, uh, directly related to the research that we did and the conversations that we had in the community. Uh, typically, Early intervention programs focus on high school, um, the kinds of things that happen when a, when a student enters grade nine and they're making choices about what's next. And um, we found in our conversations with teachers.
teachers, with educators, also um, in looking at the literature, that there is a portion of the population, a number of students, who by the time they're in grade nine have already mm -hmm. made choices that probably aren't going to lead them to completing high school and into post-secondary. Mm -hmm. So with that information, um, we understood that it would be um, an interesting opportunity to pilot something uh, in the middle school years. And so that's what we've done. The research also showed us that for early intervention programs, there are really four key, we call them pillars, characteristics, attributes, um, that make a difference in terms of quality programming that help kids be successful. So the first to see on the screen is, is academic support. So that's tutoring. That's one-on-one -on -one support in the academic realm. If kids can't read or if kids aren't understanding uh, numeracy, um, their education path is, is going to be a challenging one. But it's, it's, not, just, um, it's not just learning. Uh, we also recognized in the literature that mentoring is really important. So students from disadvantaged communities need to have role models. They need to have somebody who has um, walked in their shoes, um, who is now seen to be a success, who used education as a way to better themselves, better their families, um, and we build mentoring as well into, uh, into the programs of evidence. Goal setting is also really important. Again, if you don't have role models, if you don't know where your, um, where your opportunities lie, um, setting goals isn't necessarily something that's, that's part of your, your family context or your community context. We need to build that nurturing uh, relationship in and help set some goals. And, and along with goal setting, it's not just sort of picking a goal and I want to be a this or I want to be a that. Um, it's really important that there's also timely and accurate information. So if you want to be an architect and you haven't thought about taking math courses until grade 12, well, there's probably going to be some challenges there. And you may not know that if you don't have um, an architect in your family or in your community or somebody who would have provided that information along. Mm -hmm. And, and last, um, lastly, in terms of our four pillars, uh, we talk about incentives. And, and typically in early intervention programs, incentives are things like tuition for post-secondary care. Um, for a student who's in grade six or seven, that may not be a hook, that may not be a catch for them. It certainly is appealing to their parents, as, as I've seen. Um, but for the students themselves, we're talking about incentives that keep them on the path. So um, little things along the way, trips someplace interesting, or uh, um, a computer game or a program, just things that uh, encourage students to continue to make the right, healthy, good choices um, in their academic pathway. In terms of what we what we do with that information, so those are kind of the critical component, components of, of the pillars upon which um, Abacus is built. We then designed three areas of intervention. The first, um, as Terry alluded to, is working with community organizations, great partnerships, developing um, um, high quality programming, programming that relates back to the four pillars to work with a number of kids outside of the school system principally. So the Boys and Girls Club, um, Empowerment Square, these are the kinds of organizations that we work with. And they do things like homework club, with mentoring, with, um, uh, with support for parents. Um, there's, a, there's a range of them, and this makes up the bulk of what Abacus is. Um, over the last uh, two rounds, two years, we've granted $2.6 million to, uh, to community programs. Um, grad track is the second component of uh, our Abacus intervention. And grad track is a more specific, targeted intervention. Um, it's, a, it's a small pilot at this moment in time. Um, we're in two schools, one in the Catholic board, one in the public board. Um, and we have um, uh, put into the classroom a, a person called a learning coach. This person works with a group of cohort of students, 20 in each of the two schools, and is actually operationalizing with these students, building one-on-one -on -one relationships, and then walking them through the principles of the four pillars. So making sure that they have academic support, that they have mentoring, um, in fact, some cases, Jen, in fact, is the mentor, um, provide goal setting and, and incentives. And so, really, the, the, the pure kind of operationalization of the four pillars is what we're trying to do in the school board um, with support and um, cooperation from the board, from the principals, from the teachers in class, uh, and seeing if we can't model a different way of working in class that, um, that helps move these kids forward. 
the last uh, component, and one of the pieces that um, is, is trickiest to define, but I think probably ultimately most important, um, really builds on the work that we did in poverty. Um, recognizing that HCF alone uh, wasn't going to move the needle on poverty particularly well, uh, that we needed to partner, we needed to understand um, the history, uh, the tensions that arise within the system, within the larger system, uh, in this case, um, education. So, unlike in poverty, where we helped find, found the um, uh, Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty and Reduction, with our work in education, we're spending a lot of time really understanding uh, through the programs that we're funding what their needs are. Where are they running into barriers? Where are they running into challenges? Uh, in the early days, some programs were having a hard time accessing space in schools. Um, so were we able to, to work through some of those barriers with them? Um, there are other policy challenges that um, organizations face, quite frankly, that we're seeing in our work through, um, through grad tracks, so on the ground kinds of things where Jen is um, identifying challenge for a student and the support just isn't there to be able to help that student through. So we're working again in partnership with the school boards, thinking about how we can change systems um, to ultimately make uh, the system more responsive and, um, and, and uh, hopefully uh, be able to uh, hit some of the targets that we have for ourselves. The last piece I want to talk about, which isn't on the slide, is how are we going to know if any of this is working? Quite frankly, um, these are big um, uh, big goals that we've set for ourselves. We, we alone are not going to be able to move the needle. Um, so what we're doing is um, rigorously evaluating the work that we're undertaking. So we, we evaluate um, the organizations that we grant to, their programs. We try to develop some program outcomes for them. How many students are they working for? What difference are they making? Um, is our grades going up? Is attendance improving? Some of the basic um, um, outcomes that we'd like to see. Um, we're evaluating in a randomized in a controlled way, um, grad track, so that we have, again, a partnership, privacy protocols in place with the two boards, so that we really will understand what difference after three years grad track has made in the lives of these 40 kids. Um, systems change, obviously, is a little bit more complicated to evaluate, um, but we're working, again, in a framework that says, um, where there are challenges, let's not ignore them, let's not say that those systems challenges or barriers are um, something that we can't overcome. We sit down with our partners, we build relationships, and we create processes, ideally, to work through those, uh, through those system challenges. So that is a bit of a description of Abacus. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, following Gene's presentation, and again, um, available through our website and um, email, social media, to, uh, to talk further about Abacus at your convenience. Thanks. So Gene was teasing me earlier that I'd never met a microphone that I didn't like, and that's something that we share mutually. Uh, and I rarely read, but because your bio is so impressive, I want to do justice to it. And, and we are honored to have you here. Dr. Gene Clinton is a clinical professor, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster. She is on staff at uh, Mac Children's Hospital with cross appointments in pediat pediatrics and family medicine and an associate in the Department of Child Psychiatry. University of Toronto and Sick Kids. She's also a senior scientist at the Infant Child Health Lab at McMaster University. She's also a fellow of the Child Trauma Academy. She's been a consultant to children and youth mental programs, child welfare, and primary care for almost 30 years. And Dr. Clinton was recently appointed as an education advisor to the Premier of Ontario and the Minister of Education. Um, for those of you who have had a chance to work with Gene, as I have over the years, uh, what you'll also know is that she is a passionate mm -hmm. champion for kids uh, and a great collaborator. She's somebody that listens well, uh, that has developed an international reputation both as a speaker and a researcher and a leader, uh, but she's never forgotten that this is her home, this is where she started, and this is where she continues to be passionately involved. Um, I have a particular investment interest tonight, though. And yes. you have five kids that are now grown, and we've often talked about that over the course of the years. 
but mine are now 14, 13, and 10. So the notion of what's happening in the adolescent mind as development is of particular interest in the journey that we are on. And there are days that are amazing, and there are others in which they're even better. Please join me in providing a warm welcome to Dr. family in the audience you sometimes temper your comments so uh, Terry's lovely daughter uh, Lane Tamara is here and my brother my little brother is also uh, in the audience here with his lovely uh, my lovely sister-in-law so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and you know it's really lovely to be introduced by someone that you've known for many many years and to have a lovely reminder of your Hamilton roots um, I have been in Hamilton for 50 plus years, which doesn't mean that I'm from here yet, apparently, even though I've been here 50 years. My dad, uh, another thing Terry and I share, is um, our, uh, uh, my dad was an educator in 1965. There, were a, there was a shortage of teachers, and so uh, my dad was interviewed in Scotland, and um, he came to Hamilton to the Catholic board and started as a teacher, became a principal and a superintendent, went to the dark side when he became a superintendent. So education, education is interesting that uh, as children of educators how passionate uh, uh, Terry and I are about education uh, and, uh, and children's well-being. So the title tonight is Driving Positive Change. Uh, the adolescent brain under construction. So you might think, well, the adolescent brain, first of all, people wonder what is going on in the adolescent brain. Uh, is there such a thing as the adolescent brain or does it suddenly kind of disappear for several years? Uh, and the truth, the reality is, I'm here uh, really, and listening to Matt, I'm, I'm here really to reinforce that I'm very, very strongly and emphatically how important the work of Abacus is. Because what we know is that the adolescent brain is under construction. It's not uh, children at this age period are not many adults, even though they may look like adults. Their brain is still changing dramatically. And you know, as we think about as we think about um, uh, Code Red, as we think about the social determinants of health and think about the work that my mentor, the late Dad Offer did, we realize that even if you don't get off to the best start in life for whatever reason, poverty, um, uh, mental health, illness, significant in your, um, in your parents, there are opportunities in life when the world can change again. And what we know is that the middle years, the, the grade six, seven, eight, and adolescence is another period of time when we can make the race fair for kids, even if they didn't get off to the best start. The changes that we now know are happening in the adolescent brain are amazing. But what we have to, first of all, get our heads around is that what we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. And so my mentor, the late Dr. Dan Offord, he saw that if you were born in poverty, then your life chances were different. And I often talk when I do my presentations, I talk about that 21 year life difference between where my brother teaches at St. Bridget's School or inner city Hamilton and where we live up on the lovely West Mountain. How is it that we have a fair and equal society if 21 years of difference in life expectancy, you know, that's what we call a hard output, you know, that outcome there, death, you know, you, you don't kind of quibble with that for the most part. So, Dan dedicated his life to saying, how can we make it equal? How can we create a, a playing field that is much more level for kids, no matter where they're growing, living, loving, and thriving? And so what I love about Abacus, and I was reading beforehand, is it's taking children, young people, who are at huge risk 
of not doing well because of conditions that have nothing to do with them themselves. It's, uh, it's, it's not their fault that they may be living in conditions where they don't have the kind of support that the children in Westdale uh, and West Mountain have. So we need to think about what is our role. So what we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. So if we think, wow, adolescence is a time when the creativity, the magnificence of the unique way of thinking of the adolescent brain, the passion of adolescence, the ability to make connections that are not limited by our adult limitations, we need to have a rewiring of our brains about what adolescence is about. And I'm going to talk to you tonight both about the hard side of some of that wonder, but also I want to fill you with some of the excitement and why Abacus is such an amazing opportunity uh, for children. I also want to be um, uh, to share with you that I want to be thinking along with the Hamilton Community Foundation and the boards about how can this move from a 40 kids up to systemically being part of what happens for all, for all children. I think that's when we start saying it takes a community. It takes a community to raise the child. But let's get down to the matter that brought you all here this evening. And that is the question of why do adolescents, why do they do the things they do? So here you see somebody, I wonder as an adult, what happens to the frickin' bike? Right? But as I ask many adults, who wants to do this? Okay, in this room, who wants to do this? Very few adults. Of course, they're always male. The, hands go up. the male brain is different than the female brain. I'm going to tell you about that. But what's different about adolescence? Does he know that this is dangerous? Does he know? Yes, absolutely. Does he know that it's risky? Yes. Does he know that death is one of the optional outcomes? Yes. So why does he do it? It's not going to happen to him, so a belief that I'm exempt from that. But how has he done that? What has he said? What's more important? The thrill, baby. It is all about the thrill. And so the adolescent brain, we now know biologically, is more wired to seek thrills. I'm going to show you some of the ways that we've come to discover this and introduce a concept called neuroplasticity. So that the brain is plastic, changeable by experience. And how we know this is through scans. We used to, uh, I particularly wanted to donate my son's brain for science to try and figure out what the heck he was up to. But now, now we can find out more about the brain and in the past decade, 15 years, we've learned so much more about what happens and the changes that happen in the adolescent brain. So we used to think what we thought was it was hormones. So what we felt was, oh my gosh, we'll just have to get through this. So how we acted was we talked to our friends about how some alien invaded the room at 14 and uh, late, four years later out comes a different adult. So, but what we now know is what we think is that it's the brain that's changing significantly in childhood at this period of time. We knew the early years were really important. I'll talk a little bit about them, that the, 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 the number of pathways that get built in the early years really set very strong architecture and foundation. But what we didn't know was just how much brain changing and sculpting happens in the adolescent brain. So here's a key message. We as parents make a huge difference. We have seen an explosion in uh, negative stories about young people. We've given, we're given the impression as parents that we don't count anymore. It's all about the peers. 
Well, the research is showing us very, very clearly that that's not the case. That the, we know, and the um, uh, American Medical Association talks about, uh, parent connectedness is the single healthiest force in the lives of US teenagers. Parent connectedness. And then just as I was waiting, um, I get a colleague uh, sends me a tweet that says there is an, um, a, an assessment done which is very, very important. It's called the PISA, which is an international student achievement program that looks at 540,000 children across 72 countries. And what has just been released today is teenagers who feel part of a school community and enjoy good relations with their parents and teachers are more likely to perform better academically and be happier with their lives according to the first OECD PISA assessment of students' well-being. So what we have is the need for us to have a counter-revolution. You get the kind of sense of this? We need to be thinking not about what the popular press might tell us, but we need to be thinking about what I see is at the heart of the abacus intervention. And you know, as Matt was talking about, providing academic support, mentoring, goal setting, and providing incentives for kids, me with my shrinky brain, saw something that goes throughout all of them. Throughout all of them, is the quality of relationships and the opportunity to be creating relationships in education to rewire the brains of the young people who are involved in the program. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go deeper into what do I mean. So know that I have a very firm belief in 30 years of experience that says parents make a huge difference in the lives of kids. That positive parenting and relationships are essential for kids to do well. Relationships are the nutrition of the brain. You could have somebody going in doing mentoring, goal setting, incentives, and academic support, and if they don't like kids, there's no frickin' way a single thing is gonna happen. Now, just to let you know, frickin' comes from a story. It's not really swearing, all right? It's not swearing. So, this is all about the brain. It's all about the brain. I am a brain geek. I love the brain. Um, as you heard, I have lots of experience with the adolescent brain. I have five kids who are now 22 to 32 who I refuse to call my adult children, partly because they don't consider themselves adult yet, uh, especially now that we have some emerging adulthoods on adults, which means that they've finished a degree and they're back living in the basement, you know? So, I am a brain geek, so I love the brain because what we have learned in the past 10, 15 years, and this isn't news to you if, you, if, you, if you're interested in this area, and that is that we are our brain. It is our master organ, but our brain is sculpted by experience. We used to think genes played a much bigger role in making us who we are that the genetic, we got uh, genes from our mom and our dad, um, the uh, genes for IQ, you got if your mom and dad were smart, you were smart, and then uh, the more kids you had, the dumber they got. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> only kidding, especially since my youngest brother is in the room. And he's smarter than I am, so. But, so what we used to think, though, was that your genes determined so, so much about the person that you became. And what we now know is it's not your genes, but how your genes get turned on or silenced by the environment, by the experience that you have. So my first degree, I'm one of these weird McMaster graduates, medical school. So my first degree is, um, what is it, is music. Music and philosophy. So we used to go to uh, the bar, the pub at McMaster. Some of you will f fondly remember the Phoenix, yes. 
and the downstairs john sometimes if we were lowering ourselves to the downstairs john but we would have these arguments is it nature or is it nurture what makes the biggest difference is it genes or is it the environment and so it was a great time but i joke and say it was a waste of time because what we now know is that the genes are turned on or silenced and they interact with the environment. And that there are different periods in life when that gene-environment interaction is more robust. So in the early years in pregnancy and the first couple of years of life, lots and lots of brain building, brain sculpting by how much you get talked to and sung to and soothed. Another huge one we now know happens in the adolescent brain. So the opportunity to really make a difference in the lives of children is based now on the concept that relationships and connections matter. And I like the, I like the connections word because by that I mean connection through communication by also hugely mean neurons, <coughs> neurons connecting with each other. So our brains are composed of billions and trillions of brain cells called neurons. They go in utero to the geography that I'll show you, the geography of the different areas of the brain that function for sight, for sound, for thinking, problem solving. They go into those general areas but they don't get hooked up, as it were. They don't get connections without the experience. So babies are born when their brains are still under construction as well. A baby's brain only weighs about one pound. Why is that? They're in fact born prematurely, brain development-wise. Well, it's because if you imagine the brain of a baby and the brain of a toddler, and you think about which you would like to deliver, the one pound or the three pounds, it makes a lot of sense. So if our brains are constructed, first of all being in place and then literally constructed by how much language we hear, by how much soothing we get, by how much anger we're exposed to, by how much neglect we experience. You see, this is neuroplasticity, and you see that the baby doesn't say, this is a good experience, I'll keep it. This is a bad experience, I'll push it away. Just like our middle school kids don't question, why don't I feel like I belong here? They don't say, you have to make me feel like I belong here. That's what school should be about. They don't recognize negative experiences until they experience the positive. And then they can know, wow, this is what school can be about. So I would love if there was money in the budget to be able to look at the neuroplasticity of these students involved in abacus. I would love to see, are there areas of their brain like this that are changed by that experience? So just some basic brain anatomy here. We've got different regions of the brain that are responsible for different functions. And a key message for tonight is that the last area to develop is that blue part of the brain, the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are the last to develop and the first to go in Alzheimer's. The last to develop, and what's involved in the frontal lobes, and I'm going to talk more deeply about this, but it's planning, organizing, impulse inhibition, emotional control, sounding like a list that any parent of an adolescent would say, my goodness, there are challenges here. So the last area to develop is the first to go in Alzheimer's, as I said. So there are different names to different lobes. I'm going to be talking more about the frontal lobe, and I'll also be talking more deeply within the brain 
about some of the other areas. So I can't, I'm not sure if you can see all of these uh, various pictures. So the parietal lobe is involved in touch. We know huge importance of touch for development. The occipital lobe is involved um, in, um, uh, in uh, vision. So one of the ways, in fact, that the whole world began to understand more about neuroplasticity was when their babies were born that had congenital cataracts. So they had a, uh, they had a problem, a kind of fuzziness over their, um, over their legs. And so what they knew at that point in time was that um, a sight came online. We thought of the brain as like a machine and the machine had certain functions, it was able to do at certain times depending on the genetic code, and that if it broke, you really couldn't rewire or fix it. So when they were looking at babies who had this congenital cataract, they didn't know when should we operate. And so they, what they did was, you have to plug your ears if you like cats here, so what they did was they took little kittens and they sewed shut one eye when they were very, very little. And then after a period of time, they took the stitches out. And what they found was that even though the eye worked perfectly well, so the eye at the front of the brain and the back of the brain, the occipital lobe there, the green part, even though both of them worked, the kittens couldn't see properly. And that was one of the major AHA Nobel Prize winning when they realize that you need the experience coming into the eye at the right time to build the connection, the long reach of those neurons to be reaching out, connecting to each other, and the more that they get reaching out and connecting and building the pathways, the stronger and the faster the signal. So they went, wow. Now we know that it takes certain activities to build the different parts of the brain. It needs to have, the brain needs to be exposed to certain experiences. So I'm going to tell you some of the periods of time that are crucial in development is adolescence. When kids need to be exposed to their peers without adults around. Did you hear that part? Exposed to their peers without adults around so that they can learn the skills of negotiating relationships and connections. The new brain science tells us very, very clearly that the environment matters. The environment matters massively. And this, I usually talk about um, a book that I really loved reading called The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge. It's a fantastic book. Uh, but just before we had, um, uh, we had a, a, a get together for dinner, a lovely, a lovely dinner, uh, and I was, my horror in my talks is always that there's a frickin' neuroscientist in the audience. <laughs> and wasn't there a famous neuroscientist? Dr. Sandra Whittleson was at dinner. And so she's, the, you know, Dr. Sandra Whittleson, the one who has Einstein's brain at McMaster. So she was at dinner, right? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, and she's going to come to this talk, and what am I going to be, to, what am I going to say? But we were talking a little bit about the brain that changes itself. And one of her worries as a bench neuroscientist is that we create too much hope in books with rare events. So the brain that changes itself talks about some magnificent stories about people whose brains get altered because of neuroplasticity. But as a bench researcher, she, as in a, in a, a, a world-class researcher, she has to look at it through the lens of science to say, well, how often does that happen? Is it easy for it to happen? What's the evidence of what happens underneath it? So whatever I say now about neuroscience, it always has to be tempered by, well, this is what we think we know. Because we don't have, we don't have a direct connection between child behavior X and this is exactly what's happening in the brain. Right? Does that make sense? 
But having said that, I love the book, The Brain That Changes Itself. And I love it because of the hope. And here's a story that I want to implant in your brain. He talks about a man who has a major stroke. So this man in his 60s has a major stroke. He goes to rehab and then he goes, he's sent home. They've done all that they can. But his children, one of whom is a neuroscientist, says, you know, this isn't the end, this isn't Papa. And so what they do is from a brain science perspective says, you know, you first learn basic functions and then more complicated functions. So you first learn how to crawl and then you learn how to walk. So what they did with their father is they did exactly that. He would crawl around the garden and then eventually he could walk and uh, on, uh, leaning against the wall and then finally he actually got back to teaching at a university. When he died, they did an autopsy to see, well, you know, maybe his brain cells didn't die. Maybe Maybe there was just kind of stunned tissue around that lasted a long time. But what they actually saw was he had a hole in his brain. The, the tissues had actually died. So what made the difference there? What made the difference there, I see, is something that is a theme in my, in my presentation tonight. And that is the hope that one, it was the relationship that that man had with his sons who believed in him and saw what was not yet visible. They saw he is a neuroscientist. In his brain, he saw the possibility of his dad being able to rewire around the deficit, the hole of the stroke. He saw it and so he could believe it. So if you told me that story in 1981 when I graduated from medical school, I would have said that's major, major sci, major uh, sci-fi. You know, Isaac Asimov must have written that story. But in fact, here's the thing. You know that old, yeah, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Put it on its head. Not, I'll believe it when I see it, but I see it when I believe that it's possible. I think Abacus is an example of a program that says I will see the opportunities and the wonder and the capability of children. I'll see it when I believe that it's there. And so I think we need to be thinking about that for all of our work as parents, as grandparents, with our young people. So I'll see it when I believe it. Now, did Socrates see it? Did he believe it? This is what he talked about. He said, our youth now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, show disrespect for their elders, and love chatter in place of exercise. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so this guy was like 399 BC, right? So that is, we're in 2017, you have to add more to it. So it means that there's always been this period of time. There's always been this period of time between childhood and taking on adult roles. It also means there's always been grumpy old farts that would make negative comments. But you know, so um, Aristotle talked about it. Shakespeare talked about it. The line that I love here is would any but these boiled brains of 19 and 2 and 20 hunt in this weather? <laughs> so what I love about that is where would we be as a human species if we did not have adolescents going out and hunting and this in their boiled or otherwise brain? Where would we be as a species? So there is a biological change that happens, but there is one that we need to be thinking about very differently. So, key message, the teen brain, the brain is under construction. Not a mini adult, not an adult in waiting. 
And that what we think about this brain affects how we interact with our kids. Because this is cognitive behaviour therapy kind of stuff. But what we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. So if we think these are going to be horrible years, then we feel, oh my gosh, it's happening, look what he's doing, he's always over there, oh I'm getting the look, that's it, I'm not going to have my relationship with my lovely one for four more years or six more years. How we feel incredibly affects how we act. And so I really want us to be able to see that if we can have a bit of a scientific perspective on what's going on in the brain, it's not necessarily going to make it simple for us to parent, but it will help us. Now I was going to um, uh, change this uh, picture here for one of my own son um, skydiving which he sent me after he was finished skydiving, <laughs> but he wouldn't tell me beforehand. So, three key points about brain maturation to keep in mind, and this is the work of Dr. Larry Steinberg. The brain in adolescence, the work of the brain is to become more specialized. So if you can imagine in the early years, the brain is constructed by experience, and then there's tons and tons of learning. And the, when the brain, the brain cells talk to each other, it forms synapses. So they don't actually touch the neurons, but they send out these uh, uh, tree-like branches. And the more an experience happens, the more those branches get connected up and connect with other ones. So the middle years of childhood, so from six to 12, huge, huge changes happening, really important changes happening in the brain. That's when, uh, when kids are learning tons and tons and tons of things. Then in adolescence, what starts to happen is pruning. So what an adolescent is busy doing and focusing on, like academic support, having the other things in place that we heard about, mentoring, goal setting, and saying, if that's what you're focusing on, then they're the skills, they're the neuronal pathways that are being built. If you're in the basement playing Grand Theft Auto or other video games, that's what's building your brain. Your brain develops in response to your environment around you. Your brain responds to the environment around you. And so the creation of learning environments where kids are building a new sense of themselves, a new identity, I am a learner, that to me translates into specialized gray matter for those kids more connected white matter that the white matter is when you've got um, you've got a major highway being constructed and then you myelinate it you you um, uh, like it's put like putting copper wiring on it you insulate it so that boom you move faster so not only are you building connections in adolescence you're pruning away what you don't use but your connections are becoming faster. And here's the other thing. As your connections are becoming faster as they talk to each other, they also get faster in terms of starting the impulse in the first place. So you see, we talk in education about scaffolding, about building on prior learning. Well, that's so that your neurons, I've heard about it before, can go, hey man, I know this. And then as you repeat it and connect it, well, I can tell you, Abacus will be a program that is focusing on how do we create the knowledge and the learning that is significant and relevant to this young person's life. It's going to be individualized. Am I right? I'm right. It's going to be individualized to be meaningful. It's the only way that it makes any sense. It's the only way that it makes any sense. So one, we've got the gray matter and the white matter. You've got, you can picture this myelin getting, you know, myelinating and getting these 
uh, uh, these robust areas going. So if a child, if a young person is involved in a school system that says, like I visited, um, I visited a school, um, a, a Hamilton uh, Weber school, a high school recently, and I walked into this classroom. First of all, I met with a group of four students. And they were talking to me about their global uh, connections course. And they were saying about how incredibly powerful it is to have a sense of purpose in their education. To have a sense of meaning and hope in what they do. I then walked into a business leadership course and the kids were talking about how am I going to teach the rest of the people, how are we going to cover these 16 different rules of leadership excellence. And so they were in groups, learning together, learning about collaboration, about communication, about different perspectives, about problem solving, because they're not all the same. And the one group was creating a rap song, a rap song that was going to communicate to the other learners about what these four rules were. Now, can you imagine that classroom? compared to a classroom where you're sitting, you've got the guy up at front, he's writing on the board, here are the 17 rules of leadership of what the heck the guy's name anyway, Harrison or who, who knows, these guys. Incredible excitement about learning. I'd love to take pictures of those kids' brains and see what part is lighting up. What part is lighting up? Is the part lighting up, I hate this effing place? There is actually a part of the brain that I like. Okay, but here's number two. Point number two is that there is a changing balance between, remember I told you about the frontal lobes, the executive director? So that is the last to develop, but the rest of the brain is still under construction, it's developing. So the emotional part of the brain the emotional part of the brain, the thrill-seeking part of the brain, is developing ahead of the oops part of the brain. Stop and think about it now. That develops later. So some people say it's like the brain of an adolescent is like having a Ferrari driver who doesn't know where the brakes are yet. We get that picture? Okay. So the issue of when is this going on and what does it mean when the brain is going on? Larry Steinberg and others talk about if you've got this amazing plasticity going on, it also means you're more vulnerable for damage. So I'll touch on it here, but talk about that on later on as well. So as the brain is changing, and you can imagine it molding, sculpting with, um, uh, with the different experiences that come in, as it's changing, it's more vulnerable to be damaged by drugs. So kids, when they drink early in, in, in uh, their teen years, it changes their brains, which are still under construction, in a very different way than the impact of the same amount of alcohol on the fixed adult brain. So alcohol has a different impact on young people's brains than it does on adults' brains. Drugs have more of an impact, a different impact, not the same. So you know, people who as adults smoke a lot of dope or whatever they smoke, with a weed, and think that it's all right for their kids to do it, have to understand it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The adolescent brain is much more vulnerable. So, you know, when does this adolescence finish? So what we now know is that it keeps going on until about 25 years of age. Later in guys, sometimes, <laughs> a lot later, sometimes, as I've heard. But here's the thing. So here we've got this biological kind of a mismatch, and this is uh, described by an evolutionary biologist, that in adolescence, in, uh, there is a wide P 
period of time between when you're biologically ready to take on adulthood, such as having a family, so your biological readiness for that between childhood and that age is only about four or five years. It's the way of the world in some of the projects I'm involved with in Kenya, where the girls have become pregnant at 13 and 14 in the hunter-gatherer societies. So that's part of why we are trying to support them in continuing on in school. But biologically, there is a short period, a short window between childhood and adulthood. But psychologically and sociologically, we have created a massive gap. So kids have their first period, girls have their first period around 10 or 11, first baby, age 29. Biologically, four years. Sociologically, 18, 19 years. It's such a point now that there's a new, a new phase of life called emerging adulthood. It is now being written about, not only written about, but Ontario's um, uh, mental health strategy is including specific strategies for emerging adulthood. So it does not finish at 18, but we now talk about it going on until 25 years of age. And you read this and you wonder, well, why is it? Well, a huge part of this has to do with the, autom uh, the automation of an industry, that the kids and the opportunities for work later are less. The skills that kids mm -hmm. need to be survivals, to, to survive in the upcoming economy are very different than the skills that, are, that were uh, perhaps what we needed um, in our 60s now. It's a complicated issue. But the reality for me as a child psychiatrist is when I see parents who have their children back in the frickin' basement, they're worried, Am I, have I done something wrong? The reality is this is a new stage. Are the kids doing something wrong? The reality is this is a societal change in difference. So the world has changed. The world has changed. I have a group of colleagues who are very worried that part of this emerging, this holding on to childhood and not going into adulthood also has to do with how we have been overprotective of kids. That we have made them too safe for their own good, as it were. We've bubble wrapped them. You know, we're going in now in high school and helping them make their selections. Uh, my, my good friend who's a, a psychologist told me about one time a parent calling her up and saying, you know, if my daughter gets two more marks on your course in, um, in university psychology, then she'll have a good enough GPA to grade point average to get into medical school, right? The mother was calling the professor up. The professor said, if your daughter needs her mama to call up to get more marks, I don't want her for my daughter hung up, right? So how has the world changed? So here's an example. When Terry and I were kids, when you played musical chairs, you took away a chair. Now I want you to think about it. Nowadays, oh my gosh. Self-esteem is everything. You know, you get a trophy for just turning up. You know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the student who breathes in and out all day long gets a sticker. So, a serious issue that we have to really truly be wondering about. We have to be wondering about. So, what is happening then deep inside the brain, and I'm going to tell you that these societal changes are also changing the brain. Because, you know, whenever I do this talk on the adolescent brain, people wonder, well, you know, Alexander the Great was about 15 or 16. Romeo and Juliet, well, maybe they're not the best example, but they're only about 14. Um, uh, Marie Antoinette. One family physician came up to me after a talk at the Hamble Academy of Medicine and said that when he was 16, he went to join the Merchant Navy and he was a captain shortly thereafter. Can we imagine our 16-year-olds going off and joining the Merchant Navy? We don't let them go to frickin' beggars anymore without us checking in with them. 
So the question is, the question is, how is our overprotectiveness contributing to the high anxiety that we are now seeing in our teens? Is it contributing? Is it part of the contributing? So what we know is the brain is changing. This is the work of Jay Geet that shows that this brain is literally blue, is when it's getting uh, more mature, that it changes from the back to the front and from the inside outside. So from deeper functions like emotions to the outside. Now here is a definitive slide that shows us that yes, in fact, the male brain is bigger than the female brain. There are differences between the male brain and the female brain, but everyone knows that bigger is not necessarily better. <laughs> it also shows us, verified by uh, our esteemed neuroscientist, Dr. Whittleson, who had to go to a lab meeting, uh, that the girl's brain develops ahead of the boy's brain. So we see girls maturing earlier than boys. We also know that the brain is our largest sex organ. It is so attunedly, so finely attuned to the variations in hormones that happen, as well as so much of what we think of as our sexuality is in the brain. So what we know is that the experiences that young people have over and over and over again, the concept is use it or lose it. So there's tons of pruning and remodeling that's happening in the teen brain. So that makes us think, how should we be as parents? Is what makes me think. How should we be as parents? So there are different ways of thinking about parenting. I love this model that thinks about how do we nurture our kids? How do we discipline them by teaching them how to behave? So discipline is very different than punishment. Discipline is about setting and enforcing limits and monitoring behavior. Where are you going? I like to know where you're going. You know, just give me a call, whoever's there, just let me know what's up. This is your curfew. If you're not in on time, if you're going to be late, call me up, we'll discuss it. If you are out at 3 o'clock in the morning and you don't have a right home except from some drunk, call me no matter where or when. So you set the limits but you also have the backbone to be flexible. So respect. Respect really is at the heart of the matter. Respect is about being treated in a way you'd want to treat yourself, be treated yourself. Oh, also, that'd be kind of nice. Be treated by the way you want to treat yourself too. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. That would involve more spa time, decidedly. <laughs> But think about this triangle because they interact. So, nurture by being supportive, warm, and encouraging. So there's been a heck of a lot written on disciplinary techniques, tough love. I can tell you, tough love sucks. Doesn't work. 30 years as a child psychiatrist, tough love does not work. All it does is alienate and make kids feel worse and even more isolated. What we need to be thinking about is how can we deal with the challenges that they bring and still have a respectful relationship. So what it means is at the outset you have to have a very big respect for what they have to say and what they have to bring. Now it doesn't mean lower your expectations. Kids need high expectations. I've had families, I've had kids who have told me, you know, I, my parents don't care about me. Why do you think they don't care about you? Because they have absolutely no limits. They have no expectations. If they cared for me, they would at least have some expectations and limits for me. So we know from the research that teens have higher self-esteem when they are respectfully allowed to explore their environment. 
So what's the kind of parenting? Let's just think about this because many of you here are here as parents. So positive parenting, the ideal is positive parenting. The research on this is, is, is over, uh, over decades that shows that positive parenting, so that is warm, you're high on nurturance and you're high expectations and you're high on respect. So it's warm, supportive and encouraging while being firm, consistent and clear with limits and boundaries. Now I have a real dilemma here because usually I tell stories about my family, but now that I've got family in the audience. <laughs> um, and so there are very, very marked ways that are different about how you can approach it. There are some parents who are dominating parents. These are the do it my way or the highway because I said so, or else. So, in terms of nurturance, so think about yourselves. In terms of nurturance, they're low on nurturance, but they've got really high rigid expectations. But the respect for the young person is very low. So I have seen many, many kids who people have asked me about conduct disorder. And you see that the kind of parenting that the kids have experienced is coercive, is cold. And what they say, I need to really clamp down now that he's a teen, if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And they are what, um, they, what Barbara Collar also calls the brick wall parent. So, permissive parenting, tons of this, tons of this. And I want you to keep in mind again, perking in the background, that how we interact with our teens as teachers, as parents, as grandparents, is building their biology. So if you're a permissive parent, uh, you're more inconsistent. You are, um, you've got high, high love, 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 love. Don't put the cat in the microwave, okay, honey, okay, honey. I love you, I love you, I love you. But they have low expectations. They're very, very inconsistent, very, very inconsistent, and they only have moderate respect. So that's, I really want to enjoy parenting my team. It's important for them to fit in and have what they want and not have too many rules. We really get along better that way. So this is when I was up in Manitoulin Island. I heard about parents realizing that when the kids went out to parties, they were drinking, so why didn't they just bring the kids into them and buy the 22 for for them to drink at home? Wrong, wrong. But it was what was happening in multiple places. So these were permissive parents who said, my relationship, my love, 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 love is more important than creating the respect and the high expectations. The unengaged parent, who I have yet to meet, in terms of, not in terms of the behavior, I see many, many in my child welfare consultations, I see many parents who uh, may be disengaged from parenting, but when I talk to them, they love their kids like crazy. They don't have the skills to look out for and look after their children. Unengaged parents are inconsistent presence in a child's lives. The teens essentially raise themselves. In those situations, it's low nurtures, low expectations, and low respect. It's time to let go now that my child's grown up. It's time to get my needs met. He can take care of himself. So again, back to the first quadrant there. Positive parenting makes a huge difference. So if we understand that positive parenting is about understanding the adolescent brain, that they are under construction, that their emotional brain, which I'm now going to talk about, is under, uh, under construction ahead of their stop planning and organizing, that they have a huge mass of drive to be social, they need to be social. We wouldn't be here as a species if the teenage boys and girls hadn't gotten bored. Mm -hmm. Right? Anybody heard, I'm bored. Right? So if they had just hung around the cave with mommy and daddy, 
all those a, a millennia ago, then we wouldn't have had intermingling and uh, the creation of the species. So we are here tonight, aren't we lucky, because of our adolescent male and female ancestors. Is that not a reassuring thought? <laughs> and we will continue. So the social brain, though, is a huge, huge drive. Check this out. So this is a very famous goal, or lack thereof, lack of a goal, uh, by a famous guy called, uh, I think, Mike Owen, Michael Owen, who was playing, I don't know, was he playing, I can never remember, um, maybe he was playing for Liverpool, and he missed a really important shot. So, did all of those people go to a class that said, when your favorite player misses a shot, go like this, right? Or is it mirror neurons? Is it in our brains, we are wired to connect up. We go like this because we see, we do others, we see others doing that, but as a species, we feel the other's pain. We now know that psychological pain lights up the same areas of the brain as physical pain does. So, you know, when your child goes on and on and on about not getting as many likes on Facebook, mm -hmm. or that their Instagram picture didn't get as many likes, we have to understand under construction and don't say, what are you talking about? But rather think, that in fact, that feels like rejection. I did a consultation just recently on a 10-year-old girl who had refused to go to school because they'd gone on a class trip, her friends got more likes on the Instagram pictures than she did. She was so embarrassed, she couldn't go to school. This is a whole other potent influencer on our kids. So, our children also, how we would remember that opening one where the guy is, um, is bungee jumping. He has been hyper-rational. He has said that the thrill of this is way, way, way more outweighing of the risk of it. So hyper-rationality. Anybody have an argument with a kid who smokes a lot of marijuana, who's read a lot? Mm -hmm. Talk about hyper-rational. There is nothing wrong with it. There's no negative effects for it. They have every answer in the book. It is so pro-weighted on, this is good. And that's what's happening. The power of the peer. Mm -hmm. Now here's a really important thing in my learning, is that the, th the drive to be with peers and attached to peers is hugely important. It's how, it's how we learn and how we grow. But it does not mean, as the commercials imply, that they are disconnected from us. That their attachment system becomes more robust and bushy, if you like, meeting with other peers and developing that. But I so remember, I so remember a disastrous um, family holiday, where we went, we rented a houseboat up in Tamagami, and it was a disaster from the beginning to the end. We wrecked the canoe, we wrecked the, uh, the propeller, uh, the engine died, and we were stuck in a cove with no radio, no engine. We wrote SOS on the top with towels in case a plane would go by. And I, I actually still remember with my teenage daughter when she was at one point just sobbing saying, I just want my friend. I just want my friend. And I physically can still remember how that hurt. They, here we were with this magnificent, disastrous family vacation and she was wanting something other than the misery that we were all experiencing together. But you know, exploring the teen brain, you get the point that it didn't matter. It didn't matter to, uh, in the end. It didn't matter in the end that she wanted to be with her peers. Of course she did. The learning for me was it didn't mean that she loved me less. So, we see changes, absolutely. So are you noticing that, that your children are in the room more with the door closed? 
They have endless appetite for socializing with friends, but they won't go into the grocery store with you. They sit and they text instead. Peace can dissolve into conflict in an instant. Activity level can range from hyperactive almost to inert. So feeling that life just isn't the same rarely consults you and get very annoyed if you ask them questions. Well, this is called normal, typical adolescence. It is the frontal lobes under construction with the environmental drive being to be with the peers, to take risks, to get thrills. So the frontal lobes, when they are finally developed, are responsible for all of these things, governing emotion, judgment, planning, organizing. So my five kids ski race, which is kind of tough to do in Hamilton, you know, the, the big huge mountain that we've got, Hamilton Mountain, right? So we often would have to drive two and a half hours up north for a 29 second ski run, 29 seconds, and then turn around and drive back. So when my son was in, one of my sons who will remain nameless, was in his teen years, we drive up there and he's forgotten his ski helmet, right? So you, you can't come hurtling down that fast a hill without his helmet on. So I could have done logical consequence, except I never have. Um, and, and I had no, absolutely no confidence that if I said to my son, well, I guess, honey, if you don't get to ski today, then you'll remember from now on to bring your helmet, won't you? No confidence, zero, that that would happen. But what I understood was that his brain, his planning brain, was under construction. What he needed was me to be an external helper to develop that planning strategy. So what we said was, we don't pull out of the driveway without going over the list of what it is that you need there. So you need your helmet, your skis, all of these. It's amazing what we have not taken on ski holidays. <laughs> but, so we, but for racing, we had this list. And eventually my son said, you know, Mom, as we were put, we'd be pulling out the driveway or in the car and say, the list? So not, have you got everything? Remember the time you forgot to do it? No, the list. And um, he would eventually say, Mom, you don't need to worry about it. Everything's in there. As soon as I come off the ski hill, I drop everything into my bag. Now it's a public health hazard. <laughs> so you see, I am not packing his bag for him, right? I'm not packing his bag for him. I'm giving him a cue, and he develops his own cue to make sure that it gets in there. Now it brings up the other point about how do we most effectively communicate? So we have to have rules in our house. I know who's at home by the, the, the number of shoes at the door. Well, now it's the number of cars in the driveway, but the number of shoes at the door. Now, it takes a very long time to train up children, shall we say. So backpacks in the front hallway. Anybody have a little bit of a bugaboo about backpacks? So I am very, very good. I could go on and say, you know what? You leave your backpack in the hallway and Nana might come in and she could trip on it and she'd fall and she'd fracture her hip and then she'd get a urinary tract infection and she'd die. Right? Or I could say the backpack. So I've had to learn through my mantra of progress, not perfection, <coughs> progress, not perfection, that low emotion, few words. Low emotion and few words helps our kids develop their strategies. So let's look just for a second at one other component, and that is the fact that we, when we are overtired, when we haven't had enough sleep, tend to blab on too much. Well, guess what with kids? We now know 
that the adolescent brain, the melatonin, the, 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 the trigger for wanting to go to sleep in teenagers gets shifted. It gets changed to later. So they're not keeping themselves up. They're less tired. They're less tired until about 11 or 12 o'clock at night. But here's the kicker. They need more sleep than we do. So we have a chronic group of kids who are sleep deprived. My nieces, one of the things that they accomplished in high school, they say, is that they became able to sleep with their eyes shut. But what does it mean in terms of risk taking? If you're sleep deprived, if you've got a drive for risky behaviors, and you're out with your peers, what we see is that we're seeing more and more risk taking behaviors that involve drugs, alcohol, fast cars. Now, I just have to say none of these pictures are from home, <laughs> just so you know, so we're clear. So here's the challenge. How as parents, as we've got the greatest opportunity and the greatest vulnerability, what are some of the stories, what are some of the messages that we can give to our kids to support them. So let me just finish, and then we're going to open the floor for some, uh, for some questions. Let me just finish by talking about a really great resource that happens to have been developed by our Ministry of Education. I had a little bit of a hand in some of the, um, uh, some of the tools, but there is a fabulous tool called the Parent Toolkit Teen Edition. And what I like about it is it's gone and looked at the research and it is so easily accessible. If you Google it, uh, Ministry of Education, it was done by the, um, um, what does code stand for, Manny? The, uh, Council of Ontario Education. The which? Council of Ontario. Council, C-O-D-E, the Council of Directors of Education. So it just reinforces what I'm telling you, which is probably why I like it a lot. So that is, <laughs> be a listener. It's so important that we stop jumping to management solutions for our children's behavior and start thinking that kids will do well if they can. Kids will do well if they can. So be a listener. First Nations people tell me that uh, a grandmother, my, uh, a, a colleague in Walpole Island said uh, that her grandmother always said, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. We should be listening twice as much. And so as we're being a listener, make the most out of the conversations you have. Point them to someone that you trust to be able to talk to if they're not comfortable talking with you. Talk about things that you both enjoy. Build the opportunity to have dialogue. My one son had a very difficult time in high school. He said that um, uh, Pink Floyd saved his life. And it probably did save his life, the band, because he was able to connect in grade nine with other students. But so me, I have a degree in music, I knew nothing about Pink Floyd now, I am such a freaking fan, they are such an amazing band, I knew nothing about Pink Floyd. So find out, what are your kids' passion, and find out more about them. Why? Not so that you can be cool like them, or interfere with them as they're heading out the door, but so that you've got conversation, things to talk about. Be informed, be a mentor. Be a coach, be a learner along with your child. When we look at kids who are successful in school, parents' involvement is huge. And it's not parents' involvement in, um, uh, in uh, volunteering in the school. It's what you create at home. That's the parent involvement and engagement that matters the most. So ask them about their learning. In our EQAO results, the kids write things at the back of the, uh, once they're finished, and they ask them about, do you talk about school with people at home? Less than half of kids in grade three are asked about school when they get home. Wow. Part of what's happening in a program like Abacus, I'm sure, is that the parents are also becoming engaged and involved and interested in what it is that you're learning. Be a learner and be a guide. 
So let me just close then uh, in these last 30 seconds with, um, uh, with a story from my friend Mary Gordon. I want, to leave, I want to leave you guys with a real sense of hope and opportunity that change in relationships make a difference. So my friend Mary Gordon developed a program called Roots of Empathy. And in Roots of Empathy, I'm the Roots of Empathy champion in Hamilton. Um, uh, and we have got some great, great work happening. And um, it's when a baby and parents visit a classroom once a month for the school year. And the kids learn about synapses and, and neurons and nonverbal communication and temperament. And this day, Mary was telling the Dalai Lama that in this classroom, this day, the, the, the teacher, the mom was talking about temperament. And she said, in the classroom, there was this boy who was 14. The other kids were 12, because life had been kind of unkind to him. He'd seen his mom murdered when he was four. He had lots of diagnoses, lots of foster homes. So he was a, he was a, really, a really troubled young fellow. But mom, this day, was talking about temperament. And she said, you know, we wanted a really snuggly baby, but you get the baby the creator sends, and he loves to look out on the world and kick his feet and interact with everybody. He's a baby Terry, probably. <laughs> Lovely, little extrovert, little extrovert. So he loves to do this. So would anybody like to try using the snuggly? So did this boy, Daryl, come up and say, I'd like to try it? So the mom handed him the baby, and didn't that baby just snuggle right in? For the rest of the class, that's all that happened. The baby snuggled into this boy. At the end of the class, he brought the baby back to mom, and he turned to the Roots of Empathy facilitator and said, do you think somebody who's never been loved can learn to be a dad? So I, want, I love that story. I know it's a hard story to hear. I love that story because of the hope, because of the changes in the brain and the changes that that boy saw possible of himself. I'm convinced what I've heard about what the Abacus program is offering kids can create that same kind of hope and change. And I can then commend the Ham Community Foundation for and supporters for the amazing work of doing it. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're going to switch over to another modality. That was wonderful. What an inspiring and hopeful message. And uh, what a challenge and an opportunity for all of us that are parents. So we're, I know, inspired. Now, I, I do have to tell you, there is no factors anymore. Oh, I know. I know. So we've dated each other. Right? Um, it's now an opportunity for you, this packed audience, obviously interested in Gene's message and the lives of kids in our community to, uh, to engage with us and to put questions uh, to both Gene and Matt. And uh, we're going to have about uh, 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. And the only thing I would ask is that uh, you respectfully try and, and uh, put a question and, um, and, and then allow others to do likewise. And there are no shrinking violence in this audience, I can respect as much in Hamilton. There's one, uh, there are two roving mics, and uh, Jill, if you will, there's somebody at the back that wants to start the conversation. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm wanting to know if there's any possibility for healing of the brain for kids who are doing all the week now in, in the early ages, in the early stages. So, is there, um, is there a hope for the, the child who just now is deeply involved in smoking marijuana? Yes. 
and it's their hope, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, the, um, the power of a sense of being able to do good and contribute can absolutely change that young person's view of themselves. And so I have just happen to love the Boys and Girls Club that are here. Um, young people who have a sense of meaning and purpose in their life and connect with a peer group that doesn't do as much, uh, as much marijuana can make a huge difference in a child's life. Second, uh, do you repair? Is there, uh, we're not sure about is there, uh, if, so in terms of the damage that marijuana can cause to the brain, it is such, uh, some children, young people can smoke marijuana and develop schizophrenia. Some children can smoke marijuana uh, and be the valedictorian and have no big effect that's seen at that point in time. The problem is it's kind of Russian roulette. And so the idea, the message I feel should be always, that always be working with kids who are smoking a lot of marijuana to have more connection and meaning and um, a sense of purpose in their lives. Okay. Question over here. So, I'm Daryl Dog Spader from Six Nations. I'd like to discuss the intergenerational effects of trauma. Uh, people understood that from the survivors of the uh, Holocaust, that we, the indigenous people, we had our own Holocaust in residential schools. And the story is told at the very end about people who've never been loved, particularly those who were sexually abused in residential schools, how that intergenerational effect is playing out now with the number of suicides, uh, particularly in the northern communities, and what measures uh, would you see, and what would you say about the federal government when they were asked last spring for $100,000 so they could do a intervention when they heard of a you know, suicide pact. Uh, federal government refused and it took a anonymous donor to uh, provide the money. Wow. Wow. So thank you, Miigwech, for your uh, very challenging question, Mr. Dog Satter. Um, so a couple of things. I think what we're learning about intergenerational trauma, we used to think that, and I remember my, uh, my friend uh, and uh, um, an elder, Diane Longboat, talked to me many years ago about uh, the belief in First Nations of intergenerational trauma. And I tried to get my kind of science head around it. Well, how, how can that be? Is it that you parent differently and that's what affects? And now the science, finally, is catching up to the teachings of the elders. And what we now know is that there is a science called epigenetics. And what we're now seeing is that events that happen in utero are not, uh, we used to think that the little tags on the gene called the epigenome got washed away when, you, when the egg and sperm joined. We know from the science show that there is now intergenerational transmission of those epigenetic tags. So I've often wondered why is it that we don't have as many older, elder people in our First Nations community? Why do we have such rapid diabetes and other cha um, medical challenges? And the science is now pointing to intergenerational epigenetic transmission on the DNA which will either silence or activate the gene. So for me, it is, thank you very much, validation of the teaching of the elders. That uh, just like the teaching that children are sacred and uh, it's our sacred responsibility to raise the child as the Hamilton Community Foundation is doing, I think is so important. What do I think about the federal government refusing to send support? Well, they, it is absolutely appalling. Just as I think that the, uh, the lack of recognition of what's needed in the, uh, what the Human Rights Tribunal has said is absolutely uh, necessary for our First Nations children in child welfare, I think it's appalling. 
I cannot understand um, the uh, I can't understand the minister how she can live knowing her Carolyn Bennett how she can stand what's happening because she's a woman of action and who is passionately dedicated. So there's some bull shite going on <laughs> that we need more advocates pushing pushing for. We need it. But I think in terms of the, the, the I, I really like and you would have recognized when I'm talking about um, a, a sense of well-being is one having meaning, purpose and hope uh, and a sense of meaning is in fact from our First Nations wellness, um, uh, uh, wellness framework. Uh, and so thank you for asking about that because it points to me telling you where it came from in the first place. So we need to do a far better job, absolutely. Right. Julie? Don't use the mic. You. You I don't know, use the mic. Right. So we talked about the brain on drugs, but can we talk about the brain on phones? Because I think as a parent, it's, it's a huge challenge that, and we don't know, the research hasn't told us whether these devices are helpful or hurtful, much like it took many years for us to catch up with cigarettes. Like, how are, what do we do? <laughs> All right, so, yeah, uh, so what we do know um, is that these phones um, are addictive. We know, I was just consulted the other day, um, a school board, on a, a group of children who are going into withdrawal because they're not allowed to have their phones, um, that they're connected to um, internet and games. So, so there's, a, there's a problem. So let's say yes, one, there is a problem that um, the, we're, the science that I've been reading is saying that kids are more distracted because of their phones. They're wondering, is there a message coming in? Am I missing something? Um, the science is also telling us that they are also modeling their parents' behavior because their parents are equally, go to a restaurant and see family dinner. Um, and so we've got a role, a role to play in this. Um, there's a myth that kids can multitask. The reality is our brain is not wired to be able to be a multitasking uh, device. Uh, so I'm very worried, very, very worried about the impact of phones on children's psyche. The fact that it's never off, that they are, even in their sleep, not sleeping as well because they're wondering if that ping is going to come in. On the other side, <coughs> is technology which can be a massively robust addition to our education system but it all has to be kept in balance. So the question becomes, and I don't have the answer, the question to me is what are we going to do about the fact that our kids are more hooked to their phones than they are to their literal friends? I don't have the answer to that. I think that we need to, we need uh, to each of us individually as a family have uh, rules that there are no phones at the table, that there are no phones in the bedroom, that you charge your phone somewhere, uh, somewhere else, that there's no screen time um, uh, two hours before uh, before sleep. So you set these kind of you set these kind of guidelines as a family and have the guts to stick with it and have the, um, uh, the integrity to apply it to yourself as well. I keep handing this back. No, it's right here. Uh, no. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear what you have to say as well, because you've got kids in this. <laughs> yeah, and she's probably watching on um, Instagram or oh, yeah. Facebook right now, so yeah. put your photo in, Hannah. <laughs> right back here. Yeah. Uh, here. Here's the mic. Celeste, Science says that um, you said there are different uh, uh, portions of brain, right? So science also says that if you uh, develop music, then children who are good in music, they, uh, they perform better in maths. Children uh, who learn uh, language, they perform better in some things. I find that there are so many options right now that children, sometimes the children are overloaded uh, with different things. They are just uh, taking one hobby because the parents read from the various magazines that, okay, you read to this, this is going to be better. They're overloaded and uh, they are not getting enough time, the brain doesn't get enough time to focus on one thing before they jump to another thing. And it keeps this place a lot of confusion in their minds. And then when the adolescence period comes, then it's just, they're just silent, as you said, that they're in their rooms. And the parents 
start wondering what's wrong with him. The how, and then at the same time you said that we are protecting our children too much. So it's, it's a very confusing, uh, it's like a dilemma, what, what and how and how much should be done. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous question as well. These are all great questions. I've gone to the nice easy one. <laughs> uh, so so what, what comes to my mind is the, the, um, uh, the work of uh, David Elkind long ago, who talked about the hurried child. That, um, that, and there's now a writer called Alison Gopnik who writes about a book called The uh, Carpenter and the Gardener and it asks the question, what do we see our role as parents as being? Do we see ourselves as stuff, what I call stuffing the duck? And that is, you know, force feeding our kids to be involved in multiple activities so that they can, so that we can produce the best human being possible. Is that how we see our role? Or do we see ourselves more as a gardener, as creating the conditions where kids can thrive, where they can, you, the conditions in the soil, the opportunities, but it's not uh, opportunities for them all to turn out the same. And so my own way of thinking of it is much more like the, the, um, the, the child and the parent as garden. That we shouldn't think about parenting as a verb, but parenting as a relationship. Right? So you're describing doing parenting to kids by putting them on, in all of these things so that they turn out the right way. Whereas parenting as a relationship is really about thinking, how do you create the conditions for optimal development in this, uh, uh, in this child? So the focusing on skill development in an area, but with huge opportunities for kids just to play, just to play. I read about a little four-year-old uh, the other day who said, I don't do outside. <laughs> I don't do outside. So I think, I think the, other, the other big piece of that is that we need to be thinking about, are we over-programming and taking away play? So that's, uh, I think, a hugely important piece. Thank you. I think I'm all right. I'm most curious about your young adult in your basement because that is a real thing. Is there an end in sight? <laughs> is there an end in sight yes. to uh, yes to uh, uh, what, do you know? I think sociologically, I think that we have to really very seriously examine how we value our young people. Um, I think that the creation. The creation of a work society that is going to leapfrog a whole generation of young people. So there's a whole a whole group of chill, of young people who are um, it's it's called NEAT. So not in, in employment, education, or training. That as a society we have allowed a group of young people as emerging adulthoods to have no future in mind. So I think as a society, we very much have to be thinking about, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, how, how hostile society is becoming to young people. Young families, absolutely. What's the price of childcare? What's the price of, uh, what the price of housing? So I don't see that we have an end in sight until as an education system, as a, a, a civil society, we actually say we can't be losing this percentage of kids at this rate anymore. So not the most hopeful. <laughs> We're going to take about two more questions and then we'll have some concluding comments. Lena Herico. Hello. Hi. Um, so, a teenager's biological clock moves back about two hours, you said. Yes. Um, and teenagers also need more sleep than an adult. So, by you saying this, do you support later start times in schools? <laughs> Can you tell me? You betcha. That's fantastic. You betcha. Are, are we having that conversation in Hamilton? 
I see a nod from a third person. Thank you. Yeah, so many. So we just have to have the director of education. God bless you. That's a great question. That comes so that comes up every year, every time we do time studies around study times. And so the research says clearly this, and I see my son, who's 17, trying to get to bed at 6.30 in the morning because the bus takes about 7.30. Um, then the tension we're always created with is that we need to create efficiencies on bus times and someone has to start early because we have to get these routes done. Tension around parents who've also said, but students who have after, after work employment. Yeah. After work employment starts a certain time. Or extracurricular clubs start at this time. So it's the it's the multiple demands that continue to end it. So that so we said, what would it be like to have secondary school start later and our elementary school start earlier? And we just did a time study in an area. Um, but what becomes challenging for parents is I schedule my work time drop off, hopefully around the time the daycare and when my child can start school. So there is no, so has there been a discussion about it? Every year, anytime we consult with our school council, school communities, we don't always get the same support from parents and say that would, that would work for our family. Right? So this is constant tension that we're dealing with, but we know what the research says. Start, start later for teens would be best. Uh, so we have a time study going on right now in an area that we're thinking of exploring to test in the school to see what the impacts will be, not just for the teens, but for families. And that's, and that's the tension right now. But it's a, you're right, it's a great question. Can you just go to bed earlier? No. <laughs> yeah, she told us you can't. You're right. I'm sorry. Because my school starting 10 minutes earlier next year, so now I can't even take the late class. Okay, we're going to go to last question, Elna. Okay, my name is Elna. Elham, could you use the mic just the people in the back so they can hear the question? Yeah. Uh, thank you for a beautiful presentation. Uh, my question is, following through the question, that how do you see school? Is it a real world if we want to compare school? Or is it a healing place where kids can make mistakes and grow? And with uh, your presentation, since now we know, uh, based on research, that the, uh, the brain is under construction. So uh, how do you see a system change with regard uh, rights, responsibility, and accountability for educators? So um, I think that's a, a really important question. Um, one of the things that we in Ontario have um, just seen in the past couple of years is a, a sh uh, uh, an addition to the purpose of education in a, a document called Achieving Excellence. And now well-being is in fact a solid pillar of our, so pu public education now is about the well-being of students and teachers. It's about uh, public confidence, achievement, and closing the gap. Um, so I think that we now have an opportunity with, uh, uh, with education um, thinking of what are the skills that are needed for this new world. What are the skills that are needed for this new world? To create an education system that, and I'm seeing it, you know, I saw it when I visited, uh, uh, when I visited two uh, of the schools here in Hamilton the last week. So creating classrooms where children are, are, and young people are viewed as competent, capable, a curious, and rich potential. That the purpose of education is not to stuff the duck or cover the curriculum, but to actually create citizens who are capable of what are called the, the global competencies. So a classroom where collaboration is not just something you talk about, but you actually make happen live as an educator, as learner. 
where there's healing for students who have not had a positive experience necessarily uh, in other classes, but they are in this class will have an opportunity to communicate what their thoughts are, and their life experience is just as valuable as others. So collaboration, communication, where the, the, there is creativity, where kids thinking about outside the box about the solution is valued. So there, there, there's a, a, a guru of education called Michael Fullen who talks about the six C's uh, and that really those global competencies, I am talking with him about if we actually get it so that our classrooms are really building citizenship, are building a love of learning and a love of the other and a love of the environment, then that is the education system that Canada needs. The great thing is I've seen it live. The not so great thing is it's not happening in every single classroom yet. But it is the direction, it's the direction that myself and the other advisors who are advising the Premier and the Minister of Education are suggesting the well-being as a, you know, a, a classroom as a place of healing is absolutely part of the agenda. The devil is in the details and we need more directors like Manny who are embracing this and saying how can we make it so? How can we make it so? So I absolutely have great hope for our education system. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for such an inspiring and challenging and I think relevant conversation. Um, I want to do a couple of things before we ask uh, Dr. Justin Cooper to formally thank our, uh, our keynote speaker tonight. First is to say that uh, this is the second in our Driving Positive Change lecture series. We're planning to do another uh, session in the fall. Uh, we hope you'll look for that and uh, join us again. They will all build upon the theme of the community coming together to, to improve educational outcomes for all kids in Hamilton schools and obviously be related to our work in advocates with our local partners. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the folks on my team who helped put this together today, particularly Celeste Licorice and Sherry Meredith, Jill and Tracy. Every day you are a pleasure to work with and you serve this foundation and this community really well and you've, again, put together a great event tonight and we are grateful for that. Uh, I want to thank Matt Goodman for his leadership and participation on the panel tonight and all the work that his team is doing on Advocates. I want to thank all of you uh, for being good citizens and uh, being part of this learning experience. It's now my pleasure to call upon Dr. Justin Cooper, and I'm, I'm mindful that in a foundation we are so dependent on good volunteers. Dr. Cooper is a former chairman of our board. He's leaving our board after about a 10-year run uh, this June, and we will miss him very much. He's a former president of Redeemer uh, University in Hamilton and is as passionate about education and the message you hear today as uh, all of the us those of you here on the panel. I also want to acknowledge the presence of two former uh, board chairs, uh, three actually, who are remarkably important and still connected to our foundation. Terry Yates, who, who uh, drove the early growth of this foundation and helped uh, hire Carolyn Milne, my predecessor, an inspired move, and continues with Brenda to give back uh, as donors and as big supporters of advocates. I want to acknowledge Dr. Lilo Ryan, who started our work on poverty in neighborhoods about uh, 12 or 13 years ago. And I also want to acknowledge Dr. Gary Warner, who's here tonight, who really challenged us to be more inclusive and to embrace the full diversity of uh, this community. Those are all former board chairs of this foundation. And if you want to know why we set high expectations as uh, we were counseled to do as parents, it's because we've had good leadership. So Dr. Cooper, we're so grateful to have you with us and uh, all of you to this time. Terry, thank you. And uh, I think from all of us, uh, tonight has been a wow. Uh, I think we all came with expectations uh, and they have been met uh, and exceeded uh, in, uh, in what you've given to us tonight. Profound, inspiring, entertaining. Let's again thank our uh, speakers.
Tonight's truly been a, a gift, and we really thank you for taking the time to be here and to share with us uh, your research, and more importantly, your passion. Your passion for adult or adolescent brain development and for parenting, uh, and for your powerful message of uh, purpose and meaning and hope. It's relevant for, uh, for parents, for grandparents, uh, for those of us uh, working in Abacus, uh, and for all of us, uh, particularly given some of the discussions our society is having now about recreational drugs. And uh, I want to say, too, that I really, really enjoyed uh, reading uh, from your website your theme that love builds brains. Thank you for that. We wish you well as you continue your important work and I have uh, for you a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned. Drive safely. We hope you join us again in the fall. Thank you so much. Wonderful.